Right view isn't just a matter of seeing how things are. It's more a matter of seeing how things function and how we can get them to function in a way that leads to happiness, leads to well-being. This is an important distinction. All too often you hear that it's simply a matter of accepting that everything changes, so you have to be resigned to that fact. Accept the fact that everything changes. You have no control. In, the case, in that case, the right resolve would be just simply accepting things and giving up the fight. In other words, they say that the cause of suffering is the struggle against change, and so you just stop struggling. Or you make up your mind, you try to stop struggling. But that's not how the Buddha defined things. He said there's suffering, but there's an end to suffering. But it's not caused by resisting change. It's caused by the way we identify things, or identify with things. And particularly it's caused by our intentions. Don't forget that right view includes views about action in general. And so right resolve then is to resolve to act in a way that doesn't cause suffering, that leads to the end of suffering. So that's what discernment is. It's not just looking at things and accepting things as they are, but it's seeing that things can be changed. And you want to learn how to change them well. So it means that right resolve is something that you fabricate, it's something you put together. Like when you're meditating right here, there's directed thought and evaluation. That's called fabrication. You're thinking about the breath, and you evaluate how it's going, and then you adjust it. You don't just sit there, you do something with it. If one way of breathing doesn't feel good, try another one. You also use your perceptions about the breath. When you breathe in, how do you perceive it, and what image do you hold in mind? Perception here can also be not just words, but also visualizations. What kind of way of visualizing the breath helps? What way of visualizing your body helps? So you can make this a good place to be. And this principle applies in all the aspects of right resolve. The resolve to go beyond sensuality, in other words, resolve for renunciation, the resolve for non-ill will, i.e. for goodwill, and the resolve for non-harming, in other words, compassion. These are all thoughts you have to put together. And the relationship between resolve and intention is that intentions can be kind of random, but resolve is but firmer. It's more planned out. It's the standard against which you measure your individual intentions. So as you go through life, you may say, okay, I'm going to resolve on goodwill. And then you have to be careful. You have to be mindful. Remember, goodwill is a form of mindfulness. You have to be mindful that any time you come up with any thoughts of wanting to see so-and-so suffer, and how much they really are just as so-and-so, you have to ask yourself, if I think that way about that person, can I act skillfully with that person? Can I trust myself to act skillfully? And if I can't trust myself, I'm setting myself up for a fall. So I've got to learn how to think thoughts of goodwill. And remember what goodwill means. It means wishing that that person would understand the causes for happiness and be able to act on them. As we chant, may you look after yourself with ease. It's not just, may you be happy continuing doing whatever unskillful things you've been doing, but may you be happy through learning what is true happiness and how it's found and have the ability to do it. And that's something you can wish for anyone. There may be some lingering desire to see someone suffer some th for, some <clears throat> for things they've done in the past, but that's not a useful desire. Because all too often when people are suffering, they don't see that how justified their suffering is or how right it is. All they see is that they're being imposed on. We're all that way. So you want to think thoughts of goodwill for everybody. Now that may take some talking to yourself and using some perceptions. 
and you've been learning how to breathe in a way that feels good so that you can have a sense of well-being that you can then wish for other people. If you don't have any sense of well-being inside, it's hard to think of the well-being of others. So using all the different kinds of fabrication, bodily, verbal, mental, to put together a right resolve. The same with non-harming. Harming is the opposite of compassion. In the sense that you see somebody's already down, you say, okay, now I've got my chance. It's closely related to ill will, but it goes a little bit further. If you catch yourself having ill will to the point where you actually want to harm somebody, you've got to stop and think, this person is suffering already. We're all suffering already. And do you want to add more suffering to yourself by making that other person suffer more? That's a useful way of thinking. At the very least, it reminds you that you don't want to harm them, because the harm is going to come back to you. As for thoughts of renunciation, if there are any sensual pleasures you find that you're really addicted to and that you tend to act unskillfully around, you've got to resolve, and this has to be a very strong resolve, that you're not going to continue to give in. This too requires a fair amount of fabrication. You've got to think about those pleasures in a way that makes you see their drawbacks and particularly the drawbacks of the way you act around them. And you have to be able to think about the advantages of not being a slave to those things. And then again, you use your perceptions, and we have that channel on the unattractiveness of the body. Use that. And you can use other perceptions as well, the perception of other people when they're lustful, when they're greedy. They've got to get this, that, the other thing. What kind of people are those? Just big stomachs. Do you want to be that kind of person? Think in these ways. Hold these perceptions in mind. Visualize these things so you can see the drawbacks. But right resolve is not just a matter of these three things. As the Buddha said, it moves on to a higher level as we move into concentration. There's that passage where he talks about getting some control over the slots, treating them like a cowherd would treat his cows. During the rainy season, when the rice, rice is growing and there's a danger that your cows get into somebody else's rice field, you've got to be keep careful, watch on your cows, keep them in line. He said he would hit and check his thoughts in the same way that you would hit and check the cows at that time, if they were involved in sensuality, ill will, or harmfulness. But if the thoughts were occasion of renunciation, non-ill will, harmlessness, then he said it's like a cowherd during the dry season. When the rice has been gathered, there's no more danger that you're going to eat somebody else's rice, or the cows will eat somebody else's rice. And so you can just be generally mindful that the cows are there, but you don't have to be so aggressive in controlling them. But even then, he said, he began to realize you could think all day about good things, and it would tire the mind. So the mind needs to rest. So you use the directed thought and evaluation to bring the mind to rest. That too is a kind of right resolve. It's interesting the Buddha draws the connection here. Right resolve, which is one of the discernment factors, then becomes part of the concentration factor. This confirms something that John Lee said, which is that when you're getting the mind to settle down, direct a thought and evaluation are a function of discernment. As you're trying to figure out what the mind needs in order to get the settle down. When you're dealing with the breath, it's not just a matter of keeping watch over the breath or using the breath. You also have to look at how you're thinking about the breath. What images you have. What are you telling yourself about the breath? Could you tell yourself something different that would still be true? would have a different impact on the body. That way you're trying to figure out your mind, figure out your breath, as a way of getting the mind to settle down. This is what Ajahn Mahabur calls discernment fostering concentration. 
and you need the two of these qualities together for the concentration to work, and for it to work when you're dealing with issues that come up. You can't solve the problem of the mind not settling down by just telling it you've got to settle down. You've got to figure it out sometime. Is the problem today because of the breath, or is it because of the attitudes you're carrying in from the day? What do you need to straighten, about, straighten out about those attitudes first? This is why the Buddha has not only the breath as a to topic for meditation, but also other topics. In addition to goodwill, there's recollection of the Buddha, recollection of the Sangha. Just, just thinking about them can often put the affairs of the day into a different perspective. If you're feeling discouraged, you think thought, thoughts about your generosity and your virtue, the good that you have, the good that you've done. And you should think in a way that gets the mind more and more in the mood. Then you can focus on the breath. You know, again, it's not just awareness in the breath, there's also your perceptions, your visualizations. How do you visualize the breath to yourself? How do you visualize your relationship to your body? Do you feel comfortable in your own skin, comfortable inside your body? If not, can you at least create a beachhead someplace where there is one spot that is your spot? Tend to it carefully, look after it, treat it well, and eventually that sense of belonging here will grow. The breath will begin to expand out through the body, and there's a sense of everything breathing together. It feels really good to be here. And then from that practice, you learn to use the same pair of skills, i.e. discernment together with concentration, to deal with other issues as they come up. And something comes up in the mind that's troubling, one, look at how you're breathing around it, see if you can change the breath. And then two, ask yourself, how am I talking to myself about this? What images do I have in mind? Sometimes these images will just flash for a little bit, but they can have a huge impact, like subliminal messages that they put on TV stations. Just a little flash that you're hardly aware of. Sometimes you're not even aware of it, but it's there. It's already spoken to it, another part of your mind, another part of your brain. Other times the perceptions are more persistent, they hang around and you get to see them clearly. But the more still you can make the mind, the more you can see those subtle things that get flash in that have such a huge impact on why we think and feel the way we do. The same with the way you talk to yourself. That's what. But the Buddha means by directed thought and evaluation. You pick up a topic and you think about it, talk to yourself about it, ask questions, turn it over. When an issue comes up and it's causing pain to the mind, ask yourself, what am I saying to myself about this? And again, there may be le many levels of conversation, many levels of comment going on. And if you take an attitude of curiosity to these things, rather than being afraid of them, you begin to sense some of the voices in the mind that are having an influence, but they don't really make any sense. Or the voices you picked up when you were a kid, and they seem to be hanging around. And they can hang around only because you're not paying them full attention. So it's a combination of discernment working together with concentration based on the knowledge that the way things are is really the way things function. In other words, you're not just stuck with things as they are. You can play a role in making them better. I mean, after all, if things were just change happens and you have to accept it, there wouldn't be much in the Buddhist teachings. And there wouldn't be much worth in the Buddhist teachings either. I mean, there's so many people at his time were saying that human choice doesn't make, make that much of a difference. And 
you said, if you believe that, you're totally unprotected because your choices do make a difference. And what you need to know is what kind of choices are good, what kind of choices are bad. There has to be a sense of what should be done and should not be done. That's your protection. And he wanted, that's what he offered to us. This is how things work, he said, and this is how things can be made to work well. You've got it within your power. Simply a matter of learning how to bring your concentration and your discernment together. So your discernment makes your concentration easier to attain because you understand what's going on in the mind. And so when there are obstacles, you know your way around the obstacles. And your concentration makes your discernment more subtle. Because the more still you are, the more subtle things you can see. So the solution to problems in the mind comes down to getting these two faculties to work together. We already have some discernment. We already have some concentration. Just learn how to bring them together. And you'll be able to cut through any problem that the mind has been carrying around. This is the Buddhist message. Have confidence. Things don't have to be the way they are. They function the way they function, but they don't have to end up with the thing, way they are right now. You can make them function in a better direction. Always keep that conviction in mind.